we're live from Aaron and Alicia's kitchen table. Good evening, Academy and distinguished guests. Not so good an evening if you're an endangered species like the monarch butterfly, whose migratory patterns are regularly disturbed by light pollution. Ha <laughs> 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 Every year we gather to celebrate the films that move us, and the medium as a whole. This year's vision for the ceremony was inspired by the ideas of beauty, sustainability, and tactility. We are hosting the Oscars as they could be in an ideal world. The, the solo scene. scene. <laughs> That's not to say there won't be the usual highlights and lowlights of the ceremony. This is a live broadcast after all. We've already seen some really great outfits on the red carpet. Aaron, dressed up as ever. And Alicia, looking like you're about to take my order at Wendy's. Who are you wearing? Uh, the pants are by me. The dress is by the thrift store. And then this top is also by me, handmade last night for this event. Very classy. <laughs> Tonight's broadcast is a two-part affair. The first are Solacene Awards. And the second, a review of that alternate ceremony happening at the Dolby Theater in Los Angeles. As is tradition, we'll start with some light banter and ribbing of the distinguished nominees. Here's to hoping nobody gets punched. Or slapped. <laughs> so, Aaron, you are a big fan of the animated films this year, often expressing your desire to become a cartoon yourself. Yes, it's been a big year for the animation medium. There was the tragic habitat loss fable of Marcel the Shell fleeing ocean pollution, Pinocchio retold through an anti-fascist lens, the long-awaited sequel to the seminal 2011 family film Puss in Boots, Turning Red proving that iPad kids have really been around for decades. And who could forget? The Sea Beast. Anyway, another year of costume nominations, another year you're not on the list. What makes a good costume, Alicia? Accurate, memorable, realistic, everything, everywhere, all at once. Those words seem to turn up in almost every category. The last year has continued a long line of iconic original songs and film. Truly a historic lineage. From Somewhere Over the Rainbow to The Circle of Life. You've got a friend of me all the way to 2023. Applause from Tell It Like a Woman. This year saw a lot of people getting out to cinemas and drinking from the well of communal storytelling, just as Tom Cruise wanted. Just as Tom Cruise told us in that weird video before Top Gun screenings. For me, the highlight of my movie-going year was seeing a re-release of Avatar in the biggest cinema in Europe on a trip to Paris. For me, it was watching George Clooney and Julia Roberts bantering in their rom-com Ticket to Paradise dubbed in Greek, in a haze of cigarette smoke. Stray cats lapping at your ankles. But whether making the trip to your local cinema, or streaming at home wearing nothing but your underwear, and savoring the off-brand Skittles... Giggles. This year's films have been as we live in a society as ever. And let's not forget about Rihanna singing Lift Me Up as Black Panther Wakanda Forever's credits rolled. Powerful. So without further ado, let's get to the most fun part of the show, the Anti Awards. So for this section of the ceremony, something that we're calling something like the Solocene Razzies, we have five awards to give out, three of which we've kind of dubbed the Triangle of Sadness, mm. topical term. The Triangle of Sadness is the inversion of the Triangle of Hope, which is the Solocene <laughs> trifecta. Yeah, the Triforce. Mm -hmm. So instead of beautiful, sustainable, and tactile, we're giving out an award that represents the worst of each of those three categories. Mm -hmm. The ugly, floaty, and the temporary. And we have our... Trophy. We have our trophy, just one second. For those of you watching, it's a banana about one day out from its ideal eating time. I would say so. So not a very solo in banana. No. As you might say. And the first film to be receiving this award for ugly is... Blonde. Do, do, do. So why did we nominate 
Blonde as the recipient of the ugly category. Well, Blonde, we actually had a little bit of a dispute about this category. A heated dispute, you might say, each of mm. us pushing for our favorites. But I think ultimately Blonde won out despite the concern that it is even too ugly to mention on the mm. Solar Scene podcast. Because Blonde is a film that's ugly visually, for sure, but also ugly spiritually. Let me put it like that. Mm. We, in fact, couldn't finish the film. Yes. I think we made it about two thirds, I'll be generous, about a halfway to two thirds. Mm -hmm. And I don't recommend this film. No. It makes you feel dirty. It's very, very dark. Yeah, very dark, very gray. Mm. It has this, you know, just talking about the aesthetics for a moment, this kind of throwback, like trying to be of the era in the old Hollywood style, but with a, with a kind of gross digital like sheen to it, if that makes any sense. Mm. And yeah, it's just the edit, the compositions, the colors, none of it was so seen. Yeah. So the next category is the floaty category, which essentially means you can't imagine living in this world. <laughs> it has no depth to it. It's yeah. very one dimensional, no literally texture. no texture, no tactility. Mm -hmm. And this was another category, which there were a few contenders for. It came down to several animated films, but the recipient of the First ever floaty award is... The Sea Beast. There's the banana, Aaron. So The Sea Beast was a film that I watched in its entirety. We both did. Right. But I believe it caused a sort of amnesia. Okay. That when you watched it, you immediately forgot that it existed. It had these creatures, sea creatures, which we both really like as a motif in mm -hmm. film and in other storytelling mediums but sure. these sea beasts looked like they were drawn <laughs> with a a marker yeah. a crayola marker okay. and had no detail no interest and the story was just like be different you can you can do anything it wasn't there was no real layers to it mm. so that's why we gave it the floaty i also shared that amnesiac effect that you described for the sea beast I will also say that from what I do glean from reading about it, because obviously I don't remember anything from the viewing, it's not the most original of animated films. Mm. I would say it takes a lot from a certain DreamWorks... How to Train uh, Your Dragon. How to Train Your Dragon yes. franchise. And those movies, I mean, this is not for today's discussion, but I think they're just good. I know I a lot of people think movies. they're masterpieces, but I think they're just good. Yeah. So a movie that is just ripping that off, is kind of not even good, mm. just mediocre to bad. For the temporary award, meaning the opposite of sustainable. And what did we, what were the criteria for that? Can you expand on that category a little bit? For me, it was a film that was very reliant on knowledge of pop culture right now. Mm. And we like looking back at films that were very pop culture from the 90s and so on. But because our culture turns over seemingly every few hours, there's right. a new meme, there's a new trend, there's a new app that's trending. It's already outdated watching this film. Sure. So that was one big part that it was already outdated. It wasn't looking ahead to the long term, to the being a staying film. Yeah, the opposite of timeless. Mm -hmm. I will also say there was something just off about its whole presentation, the look. The script, the story. It was like Eat the Rich, but in a. It was a very strange presentation yeah. of the subject matter. We've seen a few similar uh, similar kind of comedies come out this year. We we recently watched Triangle of Sadness, The Menu, of course, taking on the culinary world, but in a similar mm. kind of class analysis. Yeah, both of which did it leaps and bounds <laughs> better <laughs> yes. than Glass Onion, which was. We did, yeah, that, really that's didn't the do it announcement of it. Oh, yeah. The winner <laughs> of the temporary award is Glass Onion. Yeah, A Night Out Mystery. Mm. So Netflix not faring very well so far, because I think those three were actually all Netflix films. Yeah, our apologies, <laughs> Netflix. Yeah. So the next category is called The Hidden Germ. <laughs> so this film doesn't need to have been released this year. It just needs to have been viewed by the Academy. Right, you and I. Yes. And we each nominated 
our own hidden germ mm. just to kind of bring the germs to light yes. so people don't feel like they need to watch these films if they haven't yes i'll i'll go for mine first and again there are a few contenders what kind of um brought this one home for me is with the idea of the hidden germ mm. it can't really be a film that has a reputation as being bad to mediocre it has to be a film that at least in some circles is touted as good good art or that it's so underground yes no one even knows it exists well the film i chose was called hardcore henry mm. so let's give the, the solo scene razzie to that um it came out in 2015 it's a it's a russian let's say action adventure film and i was really kind of interested in this movie when it first came out and i've wanted to watch it for a good few years because it's shot in a first person perspective mm. it's like a video game first person adventure or first person shooter where the titular Henry is some kind of cyborg and we're seeing the whole film through his eyes. And there's a lot of guns, there's a lot of parkour, mm. there's a lot of swearing, and there's a lot of just unsolicited things. It's very violent. Um, I wouldn't recommend certainly that you watch it because I think you would combust or yeah. just dissolve into a pile of tears. So Hardcore Henry, that gets my, uh, my shout for the jam of the year. Nice. My two germs, it was a toss-up between two Keanu Reeves heavy films <laughs> okay. and not the films one would expect. Mm. So it was a toss-up between SPF 15 SPF 18. 18 and Sponge <laughs> on the Run. Two films that featured this great actor, but t to their detriment. Right. So I gave it to Sponge on the Run because I took personal offense yeah. while watching this film as it was entirely a ripoff of the original spongebob movie mm. it was the exact same plot they're going to atlantis yeah but this time they're going to this time it was king poseidon instead of king neptune yeah and also instead of shall say to his atlantis mm -hmm. and instead of him balding it was his this is skin was his getting skin, bad. His skin getting bad. There were also shades of the Where's Gary? Or, yeah. you know, the Snail Come Home episode from, from the SpongeBob mm -hmm. run as well. And the worst part for me, the part that made me shrivel in fear, was that they plugged the SpongeBob TV show. <laughs> the spinoff. The spinoff, Camp Corral. Camp Coral? I I'm don't, not sure. Um, they plugged a TV show within a film. Many times. That is... La layers of darkness that I couldn't even <laughs> fathom because it's like oh it's gonna be a bad Spongebob movie that's fine but this this plugging of a tv show that is as a Spongebob fan just not canon like we know how they all met we know the history of these characters and then you're just rewriting it right for the sake of a new tv show with really big eyes S Gary is apparently immortal and just lives forever <laughs> like anyway it was overall a hidden germ. If you haven't seen it, don't watch yeah, it. Yeah, don't watch it. There was something, there was something especially disgusting about watching this because it was a perversion of a, a childhood classic, really. Mm -hmm. And it was so kind of grossly corporate and Snoop Dogg. I mean, the, I think the pop music appearing in this film is like the nadir of cinema so far that I've seen it. Was, mm. um, it was a dark time. It was. And for sure deserving of the solo scene Razzie. Let's wave it one more time. There we go. And the final award in our bad categories is for the overall worst picture mm -hmm. or least so seen film of the year. Shall we announce it together? Yeah, I think that might be bad because there's so many words. Yeah. It is everything everywhere all at once. Here's the Razzie. There you go. So we won't spend too much time on this because we have some more solo scene films to get to. Mm -hmm. Let's just say the philosophy of this film, the aesthetic of this film, the kind of maximalism and the cultural and media like references that just form pretty much the entire skeleton of this film, it's all rather unsolicited. Mm, and even hearing the directors talk about the making of this film, they're like, it was fine, we just kept layering things on top of each other, and it's like, I... Not to be Coco Chanel, but take one thing off before you leave oh, yeah, the house, you leave if you know what I mean. Room. It just was too much. There was multiverse action. Right. There was temporal yeah. 
It was just a whole mess. I wanna, like, this is going to make me sound too much like a hater. <laughs> but this film, I, I mean, I prefer watching all the superhero Marvel films that people kind of uh, often tout as being the actual bad things about the movie industry today, the bad things about Hollywood. Because I think for the most part, those films are unashamedly what they are. Like Spider-Man, let's say. You know, the one with all the Spider-Men. It was like, it was made with the intention of, this is a fun time at the movies. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to change your life. You know, it'll get you laughing. It'll get you pointing and recognizing. Mm -hmm. You can go with your friends. And it's, it's in the spirit of the blockbuster. I have, you know, there's some issues with those films, but they are generally made, I think, in the spirit of yeah. going to the movies and, and smiling. Mm -hmm. Everything, everywhere, all at once, it seems like it was made in the spirit of depth or profundity or philosophy. Yeah. So it's supposed to make you think. Make you think. Yes. But it, it just made me think bad things. So. Me as well. The only good thing about this movie is that it brought to my attention Kihu Kwan, who was the father in this movie. Yeah. And I will explicitly say I do not like his monologue when he's like, we just need to be kind. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, sir, we get it. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't need a movie like this for adults. This is the kind of message that you need to give to, like, three-year-olds. Sure. But him as a person, he's a soul scene person. He's just so pleasant to listen yeah. to, well, talking I, about. I liked his performance as well. I liked yeah. some of the performances in the film. But it was the script for the most part that, yeah. that really... Script in the mise-en-scene. Yeah. We're not. <laughs> yeah. If for me. But... Phew. Being a hater is really quite exhausting, so... At least you're a beautiful, sustainable, tactile hater. Yeah, that's true. But now on to the real awards, the celebration of all that was Solacene in this year's films. We've pulled out all the stops in designating real tokens of our esteem, real, handmade, artisanal, bespoke, creative trophies to honor the best of the medium. Speaking of handmade, bespoke, artisanal, we um, have a zine that without the support of the zine sales, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to bring you these riveting awards tonight. <laughs> so if you're interested in supporting the solo scene Oscars, you can buy our zines. And the first two, the proceeds go to supporting the podcast. And the third, the proceeds go to supporting Eco Justice. So check those out in the link below. And maybe next year we can get some awards that aren't rotting bananas. Well, Who knows? I think that's good. <laughs> it's an icon at this point. So Yeah. Let's get into it. Our first category is beautiful. The parameters for this category were that the film must be aesthetically beautiful, yeah. messagely beautiful, sure. and it could be of any variety. It could have been a documentary, a short film, a feature length. It could have been any film released this year. Yeah. But the award goes to... Ice Merchants. For the beautiful award, I'm going to present Ice Merchants to Aaron. Thank you. Long-time listeners of Solocene will have had us talk about Ice Merchants before because it, it did earn itself a Solocene Recommends section in one of the episodes. This category was the easiest to decide, I think. We didn't really have to think about it. No. It's by far the most beautiful-looking film I saw this year, and it's only 14 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And if you want to watch it, it's on YouTube. So wow. that's great. It is an animated film directed by Jao Gonzalez. And what's it about, Alicia? It's about a father and a son who live up in a mountain and they sell ice. So because they live up in the mountain, it's always cold. They have a little box where they make their ice and they parachute down to town. Yeah. And on the parachute down, they always lose their hats. <laughs> and then they use the money to buy new hats and they go back up and make more ice. And it's a cycle. But then there's obviously some more depth to it as you watch it. I don't want to spoil the whole thing. But I found like this was the biggest poster child for slow living. So you watch this film and it makes you want to live on a mountainside and do nothing but buy new hats yeah. and lose your hats. And I just thought it was lovely. So solacene, so beautiful. Aesthetically, it looked like it was drawn in like red and blue pen. Yeah. And it was so nice to look at. I love when animation looks like animation, when it looks like drawings. And there was such a grain to this one. 
mm-hmm. and the colors were so simple but so vibrant and just the designs i still remember the the character designs were so great and just obviously the composition took quite heavy inspiration from our third zine but we're going to let that one slide mm-hmm. so for the award of most sustainable another so scene recommends alum it is the documentary film geographies of solitude da, da, da. thank you for the award and geographies of solitude was not nominated for an oscar it was a quite a small art house, I guess you would say, film filmed in Canada on the island of Sable Island. We did a lengthy solo scene recommends on this as well, but I will just say it's sustainably made. Like it's all made on film, and a bunch of it was like developed in horse dung and a bunch of different Seaweed. things like that. So it was really cool and experimental in the filmmaking itself, and then obviously the message was don't pollute the oceans. Look at all this pollution that this one woman has collected on her island. So check out Geographies of Solitude if you haven't. We can't recommend it enough. Great horses as well. Beautiful horses. And the third award of our Solocene Best, the Triangle of Hope, I think you called it, the Triforce, for the most tactile film of the year, goes to Pinocchio. There were two Pinocchio films, prominent Pinocchio films that came out this year. This goes to Guillermo del Toro's stop motion Pinocchio. And here's the award. It's a raccoon. Very moody. This film was an exceptionally animated stop motion movie. And it was so well done that I admit, while watching it for the first time, I completely forgot that it was stop motion. It didn't have that kind of like jankiness that you can usually you can often feel that people are just moving the dolls in between sets Mm -hmm. and the characters and the world were so well textured and well realized that i just really thought that it was 3d animation or just like real i don't know yeah it looked real it was really strange it was the polar opposite of sea beast Hmm. like pinocchio no matter how close up or far away he was like he just looked like a real wooden boy and it was like how is this a thing and all the creatures creatures the characters were all very stylist and the creatures mm. so it's like they didn't look like real humans but you they really sucked you in and they had like the rosy cheeks and they had kind of asymmetrical yeah. facial expressions and stuff and it was really it had to be the best yeah. animated film i'd ever seen like in terms of the technical animation of it it was so fluid and then i really liked the retelling of pinocchio it's one of those stories that i've grown up with and always been really attracted to as a narrative and message and so watching it in this retelling in a as you said in the opening monologue anti-fascist lens it was interesting because like this isn't like really for kids because kids wouldn't fully get it Mm. so it was almost like an animated film for grown-ups very religious as well yeah well let's talk a little bit about our own um, Pinocchio journey a Pinocchio fascination that kind of grew this year quite a lot in the past year, that is. Mm-hmm. Because we went to Europe for the first time on a, on a long trip, and it seemed that every place we visited in Italy, especially, claimed Pinocchio as their own. Mm-hmm. So it was it was kind of, it was almost a Pinocchio pilgrimage of sorts. Let me put it like that. We saw a Pinocchio museum, saw a lot of wooden dolls, just a lot of small Pinocchios everywhere we went. Mm-hmm. And it, it really made me appreciate that story more, and and the, the film, the Disney film, that is, and also this film that came out, this year as something like a tribute to the old world itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a very small business owner, let's put it like that, and he is pursuing his passion for many years, Mm -hmm. carving it out of wood. There's a a tactility to that. Mm -hmm. And this film, yeah, it really captured that. It was, you kind of wanted to live in it a little bit. Like this cool, very touchy-feely storybook. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, touchy so. feely, as in you want to touch and feel everything. <laughs> yes. So for the tactile award, that was Pinocchio. The next category is the hidden gem. So the inverse of the hidden gem. <laughs> and we each, once again, awarded something new to this that we had watched this year. So my award goes to Belle et la Bête, which is the French version of Beauty and the Beast, live action. And for me... It was the costumes Mm. because it was black and white and I've never seen black and white films whose costumes stood out to me. But this, they had these like huge gemstones inlaid on the beast's outfit and then 
later on bells and it was a really provocative telling of the story normally you really just hate everyone in bell's town when you watch the disney versions of it or any other version of beauty and the beast but this it was like there was nuance to a lot of the characters like her father was in the film whereas in the other ones he's like he's not really in it as a character Mm. and so you really get to know all of the wicked stepmother the father gaston gaston yeah looking exactly like the the animated, uh, the animated version. One, it was kind of like, creepy. It was like, oh, well, that's hello. what they're based off. Surely. Yeah. So this is you're talking about the 1946 one, mm-hmm. the, the French one by Jean Cocteau. Yeah, I liked that film a lot. It was very, very fairy tale. It's probably the most I've seen a live action film capture a fairy tale. Yeah, and it was also one of the most pleasant bilingual viewing experiences. Usually, when I'm watching a French <laughs> or otherwise film, I'm very focused on the subtitles and like can't appreciate the film as much. But this one, if you're learning French. It was a nice, it was really easy to hear. It's a good point. So, recommend, recommend. My gem of the year, I had a few honorable mentions. Mm-hmm. So, the first of which is Mermaids. The, I'm not sure which year it came out. I think it might have been 1990 or 1991. It was just something random that we saw streaming in the depths of Tubi or Amazon Prime or something like that. And it stars Cher as a mother to a young Winona Ryder and Christina Ricci, and they move to a new town, and just just antics ensue. And this, the, the title of the film, Mermaids, is a little bit of a... Red a mis- herring. Yeah, a, bit, a little bit of a red, red, red herring. There aren't many mermaids, but it's a movie that we still talk about today, we still think is very so a scene, weirdly idyllic, and just a fun, cute 90s movie. Another one, of course, I had to shout out, is Nacho Libre. Mm. Because that's a film that growing up I always thought was, for some reason, just awful. I never watched it, but I always like, oh, Nacho Libre, that looks terrible. But I actually sat down and watched it, and it's pretty great, very funny. Mm -hmm. But the film I wanted to choose as gem of the year, especially from a solo scene perspective, is Hans Christian Andersen. Oh, that's a good show. That film was so solo scene. The 1952 movie musical. I almost can't say the name without... Oh, right. We have to give the award. Gem of the year. It's the dinosaur with the yellow guy sitting on his back. I almost can't say the name of the film without singing it because that's how mm-hmm. memorable the songs from the from that movie were. It was a, again a very kind of fairy tale or storybook looking film. I would think the sets were very like theatrical. It had that kind of Technicolor old Hollywood movie magic to it. And yeah, just the numbers, the songs and the dances. And let's not forget about that one character who looked weirdly like me. Mm -hmm. So I had to give it to that. Yeah, that was wonderful. All the actors were so convincing and just, wow, what a beautiful film. The story itself, I can take or leave it. Yeah. The look of the film, it it was a gem for sure. Yeah. And this brings us to the most overall solo scene film of the year, which we watched last night yeah (laughs) sorry i just had to get the award right so we're gonna have to do a zoom on this one (laughs) (laughs) if anyone's even watching so the most overall solo scene goes to fire of love (laughs) another documentary yeah another like nature documentary so for people who don't know fire of love is a documentary about two french volcanologists from the 19, 1960s, I think, 60s and 70s, called Maurice and Katja Kraft. And the film is basically an archive of their footage, which is very strangely the most beautiful looking home video you'll ever see. Like the colors were popping, the outfits, they just looked like they were costumes. And the whole cinematography of what they were filming, essentially just on their little trips just to volcanoes, was stunning I like thought. it was emotion provoking there were these shots of them dancing along the ridge of the <laughs> yeah. volcano as it's exploding and it just makes you want to cry because it's like you love these people mm. who are real people it's like yeah. they're not even just characters it's like whoa these are humans mm. and then you just see them literally just flitting with their lives again and again and again just standing casually at the edge of a volcano and it's like one of the most emotional 
films I've ever seen. It also, I mean, we're not volcanologists, but right. as a love story, That's reminded me say, of us. <laughs> because the solo scene, let's not forget, currently has basically two members, or at least tonight, two hosts. Yeah. And they have a similar, similar love story, similarly volatile, and similarly, we like to play with our lives, and we just, we chase danger wherever we can find it. Well, it's not that, but it's like we met, same as them, and then it was like they we said they never separated and i think that's how we were it's like we met and then it was like yeah we're gonna be together forever and we're gonna change the world and try and start the solo scene but with them it was we're gonna try and learn as much as we can about volcanoes which is quite noble yeah i just i think this is a national geographic documentary or something like that it's genuinely just like the shots in it Mm -hmm. it was my it was one of the nicest looking movies i've ever seen a nicest feeling like it just makes you feel cool about the world about people, about yourself. What else are we here for? Yeah. I had this quote that I was going to mention during the Razzie section. I thought it'd be funny, but I'll cite it now. The cinema has no boundary. It is a ribbon of dream. So I thought that would be appropriate for Fire of Love. Yeah. And also, let's not forget about our secret category because we had to mention it. The sixth category, we don't have an award for it, but we'll just mention it here at the end. It is... We had two category titles for it. Yeah. Either the best movie featuring planes since Porco Rosso or the movie that most made us want to live near a military base, chase the setting sun on a motorcycle and rekindle an old romance. And again, we considered heavily the Sea Beast, but ended up going for everybody's favorite cinema experience of the year, Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. We had to give it a solo scene award because (laughs) it was... Caught you off guard. It was the <laughs> definition of a film for the whole family. Yeah. Everyone I know who watched it was like, I love Top Gun. <laughs> and it was like, not in a way to like, oh yeah, I loved the new Avengers movie. It was like, yeah. I loved Top Gun. Right. And we watched it and it was like, there's that short film at the beginning of him <laughs> yeah. in the, the high speed plane, which could have just been a short film of its own. Yeah, yeah. And then there was the rest of it, which was just beautiful, setting suns planes motorcycles things that are not inherently solo scene just makes you love the military and and (laughs) and motor vehicles yeah so this was if it was propaganda it it did its job did its job and so we still wanted to give it an award because it got so many people out to the movies Mm. as i said like everyone i know went to the theater to see it you saw it twice at the theater i did see it twice which is saying something and it was just funny like it it seems like it's the first non-Disney film to have any kind of cultural impact in like a decade. And mm-hmm. that's so refreshing. I was listening to a podcast not about movies at all. And one of them just mentioned like, yeah, I watched Maverick. It's one of the first movies I've liked in years. And yeah. it just feels like it's a lot. I remember when it was coming out, there was a lot of talk about it being like a dad film. Because I think it came out around Father's Day and it was getting like word of mouth like that. But really, it's it's just a good film. And I feel like there's been something of a... Of an absence of those popular and also good films Mm -hmm. and it's to the point that most often i think when you go to see a movie like this me anyway i don't remember the character names but i still remember all the character names for this yeah you got hangman you got obviously maverick you got bob you got phoenix you got rooster i'll stop listening now but (laughs) yeah top gun the film that made films relevant again yeah thank you top gun That just about brings tonight's ceremony to a close, but there's still one final honor to be given out. The most prestigious one in Hollywood. It's a hall of fame as esteemed as any other, spanning entire millennia, featuring such legends as the kangaroo. Unofficially. Bart the Bear. Bart II. The Blue Sea Star, the Korok, and of course, Yeast. It's time for the Organism of the Week. The organism of the week is the orange tabby cat, inspired by a long lineage of famous orange tabby cats. And this year, once again, hitting the big screen as Puss in Boots. But some other famous orange tabby cats that I'd like to mention include Vito Vincent from Breakfast at Tiffany's and Pebbles, who was not an orange tabby cat, but was just a tabby cat who played Miss Norris in... The whole entire Harry Potter series. What's that M on its... Let me tell you about that M on its forehead. Okay. So a tabby cat is a coat type. It's not a 
breed of cat. It's just oh. a type of coat that appears in almost every breed. So Gothfield isn't a tabby cat? No. Oh. So there's an M shape on their forehead. It's not obviously as distinct as in my drawing, <laughs> but that is what makes them a tabby cat. It's like Mario. And then they're connected to some phenotypes from different wild cat breeds. And there are four types. There's the mackerel, the classic, the ticked, and the spotted. So there's four different ways that this manifests in cats. And then with the orange ones, 80% of them are male. So because this is a regressive gene to make them ginger, and it often manifests in the males. So the orange tabby cat is very famous throughout all of Hollywood and throughout the world. So that's why we gave him the award this year. Thank you, Orange Tabby Cat, for your stunning performances. Thank you, Orange Tabby Cat. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Puss. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in to the Soacene Oscars. Hopefully the first of many. As we said, this episode is only the first part. We will release a part two tomorrow, reviewing that other side ceremony happening in Los Angeles, that afterthoughts. But until then, stay tabby. (laughs) 